Hello there. We are about to start this thing. Give me a second here to finish up what I've got to accomplish. Ah, oh, that's a good sign. That means you heard me. <laughs> Hello there, Jamie. I am just kind of getting my desktop organized here. Get this thing out of my way. I should put it right there. And we'll turn this on. Words. <laughs> All right, welcome to this week's live stream. Yes, I am 20 minutes late getting this started. I apologize. Uh, my, a good friend of mine had a birthday party yesterday and I stayed out all night drinking. <laughs> Not gonna lie. Don't really feel great because of it, but I was glad to have fun with my friend. But at the same time, it's just like trying to catch up with Jay is kind of tough. So today's topic is about quarantine tanks. And the reason why I wanted to discuss it is because a lot of people don't run them. So in the chats, if you guys can let me know if you are running a quarantine tank, I'd love to hear that. And I wanted to also point out that most typically when people finally decide to set up a quarantine tank, it's because they lost a lot of fish and they decide, okay, at this point, I'm going to start doing better and I'm going to set up a quarantine tank. And it's kind of a shame that that is the attitude that often happens. So let's talk about some of the excuses of why people don't do a quarantine tank. The first excuse I ever hear is, I don't have any room for one. But then when they finally do set one up, they found the space. So that's a bad excuse. We're just gonna, nope, unacceptable. The second reason they say it's too expensive. Well, that's also not really true. You can probably set up a quarantine tank for between 50 and $100. And sometimes your quarantine tank can be something you used to run some kind of a previous system that you've upgraded from and you still have the gear left over. I'll give you an example of a very simple one that I made years ago. This quarantine tank right here was uh, just an acrylic box that I made for a customer and I believe the measurement was wrong and it just sat there in the back room covered in dust and I said, you know what? I can just put fish inside this thing when they arrive. And so it's a box of water and it's got a power head, it's got a heater, it's got a glass thermometer. And I put some live rock in there that was sacrificed, and I'll get into that in a moment. But, uh, and there's a light hanging over the top, and it's just one of those uh, spiral power compact type bulbs. Nowadays, people could use an LED fixture. So you're gonna use very little electricity to keep it going. And then finally, the excuse is, well, I don't wanna keep it running all the time. Well, actually, my advice would be actually to actually keep it running all the time, because you never know when you're gonna have an impulse buy. And once you've impulsively saw, oh my God, I love this fish, I want it so badly, or quarantine also works for corals. You might say, oh, that is so pretty. I need to bring that home with me right now, but I have nowhere to put it. And I'll have to risk my tank by putting it in there. So quarantine tank is actually a really smart way to go. Uh, one person already said, I just can't afford to run it. <laughs> Let's see. Um... I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to admit some stuff to you in this uh, live stream today as well, because I ran a quarantine tank for years. It was that one right here in this slide. And I ran that thing nonstop, 24-7, for probably three years. And the only thing I ever did to it was top it off. I, uh, yeah, occasionally I took water out and put new water in. But most of the time, it was just running on autopilot, and I would just replenish the water to keep salinity where it belongs. The thing is, is that... Uh, back in 2010, when my 280 gallon tank leaked, I had to completely revamp that room and I took the quarantine tank down, got it out of my way, got rid of my phytoplankton, got rid of my brine shrimp. I mean, I just I had to move everything out of my way. And I came back to building this new setup and I didn't even set up, I kept saying, I'm gonna make a new quarantine system. I'm gonna make something really awesome. And I, I never did it. And so here we are, 2017, I'm talking about quarantine tanks. So what did I do for the last uh, six years or so without a quarantine tank. Well, <laughs> I saw this stuff. And Safety Stop is a product that came out in 2010, 2011 at Macna, and it's this liquid. 
It's just a blue solution and a green solution. The green solution is formalin. The blue solution is methylene blue. I believe I said that correctly. Yes, methylene blue. And these are medicated baths for your new fish. This won't help you with corals at all. You can't use it with invertebrates. It's designed only for fish. And this stuff is awesome, and I am super spoiled with it. So I have a video that goes exactly into how to use this. Here is a screenshot of it being used right there. The way Safety Stop works, you get your brand new fish, you come home with it, you acclimate it to your tank's uh, temperature and salinity, which could take you about 40 minutes or so. And then when you're ready to put that fish in your tank, you don't. And you scoop out a gallon of water out of your tank, you put it in a bucket, like on that left bucket right there, and you put in the, uh, the green solution, which is the formalin, and an air stone, and possibly a heater to keep the water temperature up, and you, leave the, and you put your fish in there for 45 minutes to take this medicated bath and it's gonna remove external parasites. And then after 45 minutes has elapsed, you know, you set a timer, you check on the fish from time to time, but I've put all kinds of fish through safety stop with no issue. Then uh, scoop the fish out, well, I'm sorry, scoop a gallon of water out of your tank again, so you've taken a second gallon away from your tank, and you put in methylene blue, which is the bucket on the right. And in that bucket, I would then move the aerostone over, move the heater over, move the fish over and then another 45 minutes elapses. So basically your acclimation and your rapid quarantine would be a three hour process. And then when you put the fish in your tank, you're less likely to uh, add a parasite to the system. Now, if the fish has an internal parasite, that's a, a totally different thing. And this does not cure internal parasites. It says right here in the package, it's for external parasites. Also, it says on the package, if you buy a fish covered in ick, don't use this. Uh, I'm going to assume that will kill the fish. Uh, it does not just make ick magically fall off by putting it in this stuff. You know, always try to buy the healthiest fish you can find. But so anyway, that was what I've been spoiled with. I've been using this for the clownfish, for the butterfly, for the tangs. Um, what else did I put through it? I've put every kind of fish that I've purchased has gone through it since 2011. All my stuff from ORA, all my stuff from uh, fish I got from Tammy. These are all things that I've used. Now, why am I saying use quarantine when you can use this? Well, I'm saying if you absolutely refuse to do a quarantine tank, then at least do this. And it should be available in every fish store. But if for some reason it is not on your uh, fish store shelf, then you can buy it from my website and I sell it really cheap <laughs> and I mail it. So, uh, you know, it keeps shipping to an absolute minimum. I have people that buy one packet. I have people that buy five or 10 or 15 packets at a time. And it's a one-time use solution. So when you mix it up, it's good for several hours and you can put a lot of fish through it during those hours, but then you toss it. Uh, obviously water temperature is your big concern as it drops and gets, um, cool, you know, as the water cools off in the bucket, it'd be a problem. Um, okay, so now let's get into the actual quarantine tank part. I have not gone into that. I kind of went sidetracked because I wanted to admit I stopped using quarantine tank and started using this. But my buddy just moved away and when he moved away, he gave me his tank setup, which is a small uh, all-in-one tank. And I was looking at it and I said, you know, that'd be a great quarantine tank. <laughs> it didn't cost me anything. So I've got this stand in my living room. I've got the tank outside I need to clean up. And I'm going to set it up right here in the living room to where when I get a new fish or coral, I can put it in that tank. Now, one person already asked. Let's see. Uh, who was it that asked? Ah, it scrolled up. Let me see if I can find you real quick here. Mm -hmm. Could have sworn I saw it. Okay, Armor asked, what is the minimum size for a quarantine tank that would be recommended? And I would say absolute minimum would be a 10 gallon tank, obviously, because that's a decent size, especially if you're buying small fish like gobies. Uh, I almost said it, but I'm not going to. <laughs> I'll come to that fish in a moment. Uh, if you get small tanks, I like to buy really tiny fish. If you buy big fish, you're going to need a bigger quarantine tank. And so if you're buying, you know, medium-sized tanks from another hobbyist, you might need like a used 55-gallon aquarium to put that fish in because it's going to be in there for about three to four weeks. And why are we quarantining anything at all is to avoid bringing disease into our tanks. And number two, to teach the fish the food that you serve, the food that you're going to offer every day. If you put that fish in your tank today 
and the and you throw the food in there all the fish go crazy and the new guys kind of like on the edge like what's going on i'm scared to death i'm gonna hide in this coral i'm gonna hide under this rock so if you can teach the fish this is what i feed and you put it in the in their tank you put it in the main reef they might even see each other if those tanks are near each other they learn this is going to be edible food this is going to be what what is a meal and it's without competition so basically you're teaching them what kind of food you have it also allows you to make sure they're eating you can try different foods until you find something that the fish really likes and this is again the best scenario is to train a fish to eat where there's zero competition now if you bought a whole bunch of antheus that's not competition either it's all i just mean you know compared to your hogs to your pigs that are just gobbling up all the good food really fast and those slower, more finicky fish might miss a meal and they may not jump into the fray. So we want to get these fish fat. We want to keep them healthy. And then once they've been inside that tank for three to four weeks, you've had plenty of time to observe if the fish has any kind of a disease. Has anything broken out? Are there any weird things attached to its body that don't belong? Uh, is there spots on the body? Is the tail shredded or, or is the dorsal fin ripped? You know, these are all things that we're looking at a fish when we're deciding if we want to even purchase it, hopefully. If you bought it online, you might not know what you're getting. And so then you open the bag and you're like, oh, okay, well, this is not quite the fish I thought I was buying, but I can help it. You know, because obviously trying to ship it back, odds are that fish is not going to live. So we typically accept what we get and do our best. So setting up the quarantine tank allows you to keep that fish safe and it allows the uh, fish to learn to eat. And then when you're finally ready and you trust it, you can add it to your tank. So what goes in a quarantine tank? Now I mentioned the heater and the pump and uh, a glass thermometer. It's very important to watch the temperature on a quarantine tank. And uh, typically you can start it off with salt water right out of your reef. You don't have to use new salt water. You could take water from your reef, put it in that tank, and then you could you know, add fresh salt water to your reef, which is a small water change. Uh, if your water in your reef is horrible, then start off the quarantine tank with a nice clean batch of salt water. But that tank also needs bacteria. And the easiest way to put bacteria in a tank, besides buying a bottle of bacteria, um, but then you're kind of waiting for the cycle to happen. I like to grab a piece of live rock and just move it into the quarantine tank and it's going to be there for the rest of its life. And the reason I like to use live rock, it's filled with all kinds of critters, you know, worms and feather dusters and, and there might be some hermit crabs that snuck over, just whatever is in that rock, let it live there and do its thing. If you were to do anything like medicate that quarantine tank, you can never use that rock again in your reef. That's why I call it the sacrificial rock. The nice thing about having some rock in the tank is again, it kind of gives the fish an example of where they're gonna live. It kind of lets them feel a little bit more at home versus being in a box with a flat bottom, no sand, and they're just kind of like, in a, uh, an acrylic or glass jail. <laughs> so I like to kind of make it look a little nicer. And that's why I had this picture before I showed you guys. Um, in that uh, picture, you can see several pieces of rock. And there's also a couple of new frags that I came home with. There was a new coral right there. One of the things that I used to do with any new coral that came in was I had a vial, you know, about the size of, I don't know, this chapstick right here. And inside that vial was crushed interceptor, which was a medication used for killing red bugs. And I took this pill and I smashed it into dust. And I would take a little spoonful of it, like the kind from a Salaford or a uh, Elos test kit or one of those, you know, the ones with a little microscopic spoon. And I stirred it up in a cup of water and I poured it in the tank the day I got the coral. And that helped eliminate any risk of adding red bugs to my tank. If you buy some new zoanthids, and you come home and they're on a rock or, or they're just the zoanthids themselves, but you start to see little pests on them. One of the tricks we did years ago, and again, I'm jumping ahead or I'm going off topic, I guess, but I still, I'm just going to share it with you. <laughs> I uh, had something called flatworm exit, and I would put a few drops of that directly in the bag with the zoanthids and then close the bag up and drive home. So it was already sitting in that stuff for about the, you know, the 30 to 45 minutes heading home. And that way it was already done. And when I got home, I was able to dip them in some clean water and uh, get them into the quarantine tank. Why would you want to put zoanthids in a quarantine tank? I mean, it's just a little soft coral. Well, there's something out there called zoanthid spiders. And, if, and these things are not really easy to see, but they're definitely more easy to see in a quarantine tank than they will be in your reef. So by taking your brand new corals and dropping them in the quarantine tank, number one, 
It gives you a chance to observe the coral, see if there's anything weird going on, and avoid, again, putting any kind of pest into your reef. Let me look at some of your questions. Um, yeah, Interceptor was a prescription drug that you, um, sorry, uh, Mike V was asking, uh, that you had to get from your vet. And basically, the way it works with a vet, and this, this caused some chaos years ago, uh, people would say, well, I just want to buy one pill from the vet. And they'd walk in expecting to pay like $6 and walk away. And they'd get all upset that they had to pay for the vet visit, and they had to buy a package of these tablets, which might cost you 60 bucks or so, which probably had 6 or 12 pills in it. One tablet would treat 400 gallons of water, so it went a long way, and that's why um, you would just have to visit one time to the vet. But some vets absolutely refused to sell what I think was called off-book. And that just meant it had nothing to do with a dog or a cat. Uh, they were like, no, I can't do this. But some vets will cooperate with you. You bring them a picture of your aquarium. And what they're going to do is they're going to staple it to the sheet, um, to your file. And that's the patient. And so that way they can say, yes, I saw the patient. I prescribed Interceptor. And, you know, I talked to my vet about this. I said, why is it so difficult for some people to get this stuff and other you know, it's so easy like you. And my vet just said, it really does come down to what the vet wants to do. But obviously, they're not going to do a house call. And I just told people, you know, you need to go in there and say, just like I brought you a dog covered in fleas, I've got a coral covered in fleas. An interceptor will kill the fleas. And here's my article that shows it. And I'm happy to pay for the office visit. I need to buy a box of this. And uh, that was it. So anyway, interceptor then... Uh, was pulled from the shelves at some point and no one could buy it anywhere. Now I hear it's back. Uh, I had a guy in Australia say, oh, I can totally get you Interceptor. And he sent me a package of it, but it looked like dog biscuits. And I thought, this is nothing like a pill. How am I supposed to crush up a big old, I mean, it looked like a breakfast bar. I was like, what am I supposed to do with this thing? So it's still in the back. I really want the tablets. And uh, it really was a very nice, easy product that didn't require water changes, didn't have to do any carbon. After about 12 hours or so of that stuff hitting the water, it becomes inert, which means it's benign. It does no harm whatsoever. It's basically ruined. And, you're, and that was the way I got rid of stuff on my corals, you know, especially red bugs. The nice thing about um, having a quarantine tank running at all times is if you come home impulsively with a coral, you can just drop in that tank instantly. When I would fly to other clubs to speak and... I would say, I'm not getting anything. And then, of course, I come home with something. It's like, dang it. So as soon as I came home, I'm tired, right? I would just take the bag and float it in that tank. And then, you know, within five to ten minutes, I would release it into the, into the quarantine tank. And then I could deal with it in a few days. I didn't have to deal with it that night. I didn't have to hurry up and glue it down somewhere in my reef. Dr. Fosters and Smith was a, a question. Why don't they sell it? That's a good question. We should find out. Doctor of Welsh Magic says he has two quarantines running right now, but he's soon going to break it down to one. You know, uh, another thing that I learned at public aquariums, because all these guys have set up these massive systems for people to visit, they have very strict protocols when it comes to quarantine. And when they get new coral in or new fish in, it goes into this very specific standalone system. It's usually a very long trough or vat. Sometimes it's a, a huge tank. And all the things that touch that tank cannot touch the displays. So if you're using a net, that net never goes into the display tank. The test kits stand alone. Um, the syringes, you know, anything that involves that tank cannot touch the main systems that are on display for the consumers to enjoy. And they might keep things in quarantine for 45 days. So here's something interesting that I learned when I was visiting the Georgia Aquarium. The... Uh, the people at the airport sometimes seize what they consider to be illegal corals. Like the person didn't have a permit, or they misidentified the corals and said, you know, this is something on the blacklist, you're not allowed to have it, and they seize it all. And then they call someone like the Georgia Aquarium and say, hey, we've got eight cases of stuff here, do you want it? And the Georgia Aquarium gets to have it because otherwise it's just going to die. And what I learned was that if the Georgia Aquarium had a tank set up with a bunch of stuff in there and then they accepted a bunch of boxes of unknown corals from, you know, the airport, from TSA or whoever it is, the, you know, Fish and Wildlife, then they have to restart the clock at 45 days all over again. So let's say they're at day 43, two days from being done, and they're told, we have all these boxes of stuff, do you want it? 
they have to decide, do we want to wait another 45 days or are we going to decline it because these things are about to come out? Or can we set up another tank for a few days? Just, you know, so that was interesting because, yeah, if you keep adding new things to your quarantine tank during a quarantine period, you're kind of ruling out the whole observation for possible, possible diseases. And, you know, ick is something that you can see over a 21 period day. I can't even say that right. 21 day period. You don't want to say, hey, that fish is healthy. Oh, let me drop on a new one. Oh, I'll scoop out the ones that have been in that tank for weeks later. <laughs> You're kind of defeating the purpose now because now you've possibly infected your existing fish that were ready to go in your reef. So you don't want to do that. Okay. What else can I tell you about quarantines? The lighting is not critical for a quarantine tank, especially if you're running fish. If you're running fish, you don't need any light at all except just enough to see the fish to observe it. When you're uh, feeding the tank and you put in food in there, you don't want to leave the food in there to rot because it's a smaller water volume. And as you see in that one picture, there's very little filtration. Now, you can install a hang back filter and you can then replace that, uh, that floss media uh, pouch in the back from time to, you know, once a week, once every couple of weeks. That's one way to deal with that. Uh, another obvious and very simple solution to keeping the water healthy in a quarantine tank is to go ahead and change 10% of the water. Hey, I have not been sharing things with you guys. I'm going to switch that too. If you have a 10 gallon tank and you change one gallon every single day, how much have you changed that week? 70% of the water. So you see the water will actually stay very healthy. You don't have to do big, huge water changes on a quarantine tank. You can literally focus on one gallon a day on a 10 gallon tank. And the easiest way to do that, because you're like, well, a gallon, I don't want to mix a gallon. No, don't mix a gallon, mix five gallons, mix 10 gallons of water, have it ready. And that way you can just scoop a gallon out of your vat and put it in the tank. And it's a very quick water change, it takes you a couple of minutes. Super easy to do. And uh, it's not expensive at all to do that. Uh, Reef Eco asks, are there any tips to sterilize in the quarantine after a batch has gone through it? You can. Um, you can definitely break it completely down and clean it with bleach water. And that would be 10 parts water to one part bleach. Uh, get everything cleaned up, except for the live rock, you know, that you have to choose if you're going to do that. If you don't want to put live rock in that quarantine tank and you want to use something else for the fish to hide in, then you can use PVC fittings, uh, elbows, tees, uh, just whatever you got handy, some pipe. You can even strap them together or glue them together so that way they're like a little pyramid and that way the fish can go in the holes. These are all ways of allowing you to keep uh, hidey holes for the fish so they feel a, bit, uh, a little less stress, I guess you could say. But um, other than that, you know, after you've bleached the system clean, you got to rinse it really well. You got to let the air out for 24 hours and then you set it up again. Uh, one method that some people have used for a rapid cycling of a new quarantine tank running from scratch is they've kept a sponge of some kind floating in their sump of their display tank. And they'll take that sponge and they move it into the quarantine tank to move, to seed it, to get it going. Uh, for me, again, like I said you know, earlier, I just recommend using Live Rock. Uh, lots of comments here, guys. Hang on. <laughs> Now, let's say you do see something like Kyle is saying here that he's treating proactively for ick or from flukes and even deals with velvet. So when I'm talking about quarantine, I'm talking about a place to put brand new things for observation. It's not a hospital tank. A hospital tank is another tank. <laughs> now I'm telling you, you, I already told you earlier, I don't have any room for a quarantine tank. And now I'm suggesting you have a hospital tank too. The reason for the hospital tank is if what was in the quarantine tank isn't doing well, you can move it into the hospital tank, use medications, uh, or uh, the appropriate treatment. Matter of fact, I'm going to do a plug here really quick for this book right here. It's uh, called Diseases of Marine Fishes, and it's a very easy to read book that I have been working on for some time. <laughs> I keep forgetting to pick it up. I need to memorize this book because people ask me questions about fish disease and I know so little other than how to Google stuff. But I don't really deal with fish disease. I, it's so rare. I, um, I lost a bunch of my fish years ago being an idiot and turning off my pumps and going to sleep. Uh, I was supposed to be feeding my sun corals and I forgot. 
and I was like, I'm so tired, I'm going to bed. And literally forgot I turned off my reef. I mean, I turned off everything. And the next morning, half of my fish were dead, and I was an idiot. But that's not fish disease, that's me being a total idiot. Uh, I should have set a timer, I should have, I don't know, left myself a giant post-it on my pillow, don't you dare go to bed. <laughs> but instead, uh, I was so depressed after that, because I had beautiful, healthy fish that my totally my fault, you know, it's so dumb. But uh, I've seen ick in my tank on one fish once. Uh, I bought a yellow tang and an Atl Atlantic blue tang was attacking it. And the ick just broke out all over that yellow tang. I mean, it was so sudden. And I thought, oh man, I got to set up a hospital tank in the morning. Okay. And so I, was, uh, I had, uh, trying to think of the word I'm trying to say. Anyway, I was accepting that I was going to have to set up this tank, and then I realized, uh, you know, okay, I've got a tank back there, I've got to mix some salt water, you know, I'm going through the process. And by morning, that fish was dead. There was a whole bunch of snails on top of it, it was picking it clean, I mean, that thing didn't even make it through the night. I was like, wow, that was so fast. I had that fish 24 hours or less. So, didn't even have a chance to deal with that. I used to have a powder blue tang that would break out an ick, but it would also just kind of like calm down and the ick would be gone and then it would get stressed again and you and so i i would just gave up on worrying about that fish all the rest of the fish in my tank didn't have ick i've never had a thing where ick just moves through the tank one time i had what's called clownfish disease which i believe is called lymphocystis and that kind of looks like white cotton on the tail or maybe around their mouth it's these weird like clumps almost looks like cauliflower and on that situation, it was only on one specific fish again in my tank. And I was told to take the fish out of the tank, put a towel on my table, lay the fish on there, and pick the white stuff off the fish, which I thought was insane. But I actually did it. <laughs> and the fish was fine. But you can uh, also just focus on keeping the water healthy in your tank. And this would work in a, in a quarantine tank, too. If you start to see an outbreak, you can just keep the water healthy, keep the fish fed, and it can basically uh, build its immune system to throw this crap off its body. And then if you did see some kind of a disease in your quarantine tank, then going back to that comment before about sterilizing the system and starting a fresh uh, setup might be a, way, a wise way to go, so it's not just lingering in the background. Uh, let's see. If you um, do have a situation where your fish have ick, there's medication you can use to get rid of it, or there's something called hyposalinity. So these are things you can look up on Google and find the proper procedure, or you can read that book about diseases for marine fish. And that will help you remove the problem so when you take the fish that's now gone through that whole course of treatment, it's healthy, you can put it in your tank, you don't have to worry about the rest of your fish catching it. Because that's the worst feeling in the world is buying some brand new fish you love and then it kills seven of the fish you've had because it, it has some kind of disease on its body. So I really do recommend, you know, that with fish, at the very least, use Safety Stop, which I do think is awesome. <laughs> the reason I think it's awesome is because it's only five bucks. I mean, it is nothing. And for five dollars, I even told fish stores, why don't you just charge five dollars more for the fish and give them one of these and say, go home and use this. And it's, it's weird. The fish stores just don't push it. And I think it's the most logical thing to do if you're not going to set up a quarantine tank. Doctor of Welsh Magic says, please don't say medic works. Uh, medications? The, uh, one of the things that has been recommended is going to be using copper to reduce or to help clear up. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> There's a, that would be used to remove ick. And copper is really hard on fish. It can be done. Um, there's other products out there as well. That's what I'm saying. Just Google it. I'm not a fish ex uh, disease expert, so I really can't advise you too well. I would literally do like you and go type it in Google, see what it says, learn what I got to do, and then I would do that if I ran into that situation. One thing that I do not want you to do is put a mandarin in a quarantine tank. And 95% of the time, a mandarin will be disease-free. There are very few cases, but there are some. You can find them. Google it yourself. You'll find that there are some fish out there that, you know, some mandarins out there that have been covered in ick, and there's a picture of it. There's others where there's splotches on their skin. It's just like there's a splotch and a splotch, and you're like, what happened to that, that fish? 
And I had one in my reef that broke out in this stuff, and I was trying to get pictures of it. So you can find those too if you looked hard enough in Google Images. And I was trying to figure out what I could do to help that fish. And you know, it was inside my reef, not exactly easy to get to. But uh, the reason I don't want you to put a mandarin in a quarantine tank is because unless that mandarin is literally eating prepared foods, it's very likely going to starve while it's in that tank for weeks for observation. So that's the one fish that I would say, risk it all, put it in your reef. Mandarins are beautiful fish. They have an oily skin. It helps them ward off diseases. It's not perfect, but it's pretty secure. And I can say this, you know, without, you know, giving you bad advice because I have kept many mandarins over the years. At one point, I had four in my reef, and you know I got them all at different times from different sources. The one I have right now um, is one I got in 2011. I got from ORA when they were uh, tank breeding and captive breeding these mandarin fish from scratch, from eggs. And I got one, and I've had it now for six years. And it's a, it's a beautiful fish. I did put it in my 60-gallon anemone cube for a while, but the... Uh, the the there wasn't enough live rock in there and as i was and you know all that tank had was anemones and clownfish and a couple of eels and i was looking at that mandarin and it was looking thinner and thinner i thought that's insane because there's so many pods in this tank it should be fine but i got nervous i scooped him out and put him in my 400 gallon and he got much fatter and actually I, I hardly see him i see him once a day if i'm lucky if i look through the right spot but the rest of the time that mandarin is just snacking on whatever it can find I do know that he eats prepared foods. I know that you can get mandarins to eat pellet food. Uh, they can eat mices. You know, if they just ha they're just slower eaters. They, they take time to get there. And it would be best if you can make sure that they get food one way or another. Okay, are there any other questions I can answer now? Let me pay attention to what you're typing because I'm so busy talking. Looks like you guys are having a great conversation about <laughs> treating tanks for ick and so forth. And that's fine. That's, that's all good. Is there any uh, questions about quarantine that I should have mentioned that I forgot about? There's a possibility I forgot to tell you something. Should you use a protein skimmer on a quarantine tank? I just don't think it's necessary. I don't really think that it's going to make it better. Because if you're doing daily water changes, you know, 10% water changes, the water is going to be very clean. Uh, and you can tell how the water is doing when you drain it into a white bucket. Because if the water in the bucket looks clear, it's clean water. If the water looks yellow, it's you know got a lot of pee and stuff in it. <laughs> so, it, you know, ammonia and so forth. Oh, quarantine tank, ammonia alert. Put one of those in there. That's a disc that just fits on the front of your tank. And if the ammonia rises, it changes color and gives you a quick indication. Another thing with quarantine tanks is you do want to test the water. Obviously, you want to check salinity. You want to check temperature. But at least once a week, if it's running very, you know, on autopilot, test the water you know, once every couple of weeks. If you've got a lot of new fish in there, test more frequently. Test a cup every couple of days. Check for ammonia. Check for nitrite. Check for nitrate. You know, make sure that everything is good because you know, when you're putting corals in there, you can put corals through that thing all the time. You could be buying corals every single week and drop them in the quarantine tank. Okay, it looks good. I'm going to move them in a reef now. Right. And again, I didn't mention, but so I should say it out loud. Take them out of the quarantine tank and put them in a dip and then put them in your tank. Or dip them and then put them in your quarantine tank for observation. Either way, dip every new coral you get. You can use Revive. You can use... Um, there's a coral dip from ME. Uh, there is... Uh, some people are using the Bayer insecticide stuff. I haven't tried that yet. But it's really important to... Make sure none of the cooties on those frags get into your reef. But yeah, you can put frags into your quarantine and take them out and put more frags in. You don't have to change the water from that. That's not going to affect it. But if you bought like nine anthias or 15 clownfish, the food you drop in and the amount of waste coming out of those fish could affect the water parameters quickly in a small water volume that's 10 or 15 gallons. Do you need to run a heater when you're not using it? Eh. I just kind of would want to, yes, <laughs> I would say yes. I'm running the tank on autopilot. I'm not unplugging things. I'm just making sure it's topped off. If there's no light turned on it, nothing's going to grow in there. It's not going to get hotter or colder. So having flow through the tank with a power head and having a heater that keeps it around 76 degrees should be good enough. Mike asked if you could use Prime for the quarantine 
to deal with ammonia. Yeah, absolutely can. Prime is made by Seachem, and it locks up ammonia. It locks up nitrate. It locks up chloramines. It locks up everything, and it's really easy to use. A cap full of that stuff treats 50 gallons, so you only need a little tiny bit. And um, if you started to see a big uh, surge in water parameters going off track, do bigger water changes. Uh, Reef Eco makes a suggestion that if you get a RAS and you're putting it in your quarantine tank, that you could put a bowl of sand in there for the RAS to dive into. And I've done that. I've not only done that in the quarantine, but then when the fish was ready to go in my reef, as you guys probably know, I never release a fish directly into my tank the minute it's ready. Uh, you know, whether it went through safety stop or the, uh, or it was in a quarantine tank, it goes into my peacemaker box. It hangs in the tank for three days. That way everyone can see each other, but no one fights. And that way, after three days, I can open the lid and pour the fish in, and they all just seem to get along, and there's no conflict. The fish wasn't stressed. So in my peacemaker, I actually put the same bowl of sand in there. You know, I got a scoop of sand of my reef, and I put it in the bowl inside there. I didn't take the sand from the quarantine. And that way the wrasse had a place to sleep during the night, you know, and then pop its head back out. All right, let's see what else. Yeah, if you do put a small bowl of sand in there, the wrasse will definitely use it. Because in certain wrasses, not every wrasse sleeps in sand, some wrasses cocoon themselves at night and they wedge themselves into a hole in the rock work. And then in the morning, they, they break through the bubble, basically, and they swim out. And you'll see this weird thing in your tank. And that's how they protect themselves, because they're not a sand dweller. Reef Eco asks, is there an issue with a larger tank and a small peacemaker? Well, it comes down to what size fish you want to buy and then what size peacemaker you should have. Uh, the one I make is 12 inches long by 6 inches wide and 8 inches tall. And the fish I put in there can turn around. But then I love to buy tiny fish. It's my favorite thing to do. I love something small and watching it grow. If I got a bigger tang, I would probably have to go with a bigger peacemaker. I'd have to come up with something. You can always make your own peacemaker for, for nothing out of egg crate and uh, suspend that in your tank. It's not exactly the most friendly looking environment. It kind of, it definitely makes the fish feel trapped in a cage, but it could work. I've seen people that would uh, take a brand new anemone and they'd put it in a colander, which is the thing you pour, you know, your spaghetti into to make the water drain out. And they'd float that in the tank. And that was another way of uh, keeping livestock from getting into the reef. But then nothing can see it. So they can't learn to get along with it. So that's why I make the Peacemaker out of clear acrylic. And yes, it would be wise to put a lid on top of your quarantine tank. If you have a quarantine tank that's open top, and you buy fish that are known jumpers, odds are they're gonna be on the carpet or they're gonna be in the, in the belly of your dog. So don't let that happen. Let's see, any other questions? Ah, Mike B makes a good suggestion, keep your eyes open. If you're like, how am I gonna spend this money or how can I get the best deal for a quarantine tank? Petco has their dollar a gallon sales and they usually go up to a 40 gallon tank. So a 40 gallon tank can be $40. A 20 gallon tank is 20. 29 gallon is, you know, $29. A 10 gallon tank is 10 bucks. You might find uh, used tanks on Craigslist, which should be dirt cheap. You might know somebody <laughs> that's getting out of the hobby and you could buy something small of theirs that they want to get rid of. You could even use a Rubbermaid container, but then you can only look down from above and that's a really hard way to observe livestock. You really do need something to look through the side. You can use an Airstone. You can use an in-tank filter. I've seen these um, in a lot of uh, fish stores where they have this big sponge, uh, sponge sponge thing with an air stone goes through the middle and it draws water through the sponge and then the air bubbles come out the top and it's a, it's a very temporary type of filter but that's another way to help keep the water filtered in a quarantine tank but water changes are the simplest just drain water out put new water in you can drain water out and take water from your reef and put new water in your reef any more questions i can answer we've got about two more minutes left just remember, you guys, you do have the availability to watch the Safety Stop video on my YouTube channel. It's easy to find. I'll try to stick it in the description of this video when you're watching it later. And uh, it's a very simple procedure that I've been using for years because I did not run a quarantine tank. And the reason I didn't run a quarantine tank is because this stuff made my life so much easier. But I'm going to start 
I'm gonna go back to it because I had a tank given to me. And since I have this tank and I have no other use for it, and I don't really feel like setting up another species tank in my home, I'm gonna use it for quarantine. That way I'm setting a good example for you guys. And uh, you know, it's, it's a good procedure. It is the way to go. Um, Vince asked me, will you ever do a product showcase of the things you make for sale? If you'll go to www.melovesreef.com, you can find all the things I build in the uh, shop area. And there's an acrylic section, there's an overflow box section, there is the RO systems, of course. So there's all of that that you can check out. Um, there are a couple of videos on my channel where I showcased a sump I made. Um, I think the fish trap might be on there. So there's a few things that you can check out there. Uh, how do you notice internal parasites? Good question. Most usually, the way I'm aware of it is that when a fish poops out something that looks long and stringy, that was due to an internal parasite. And the problem is the next fish then will eat that stringy stuff and now it's in their gut. So you want fish that don't poop out long stringy stuff. And you definitely don't want them pooping the stringy stuff into your reef. Okay, guys. Thank you so much for your time. I'm sorry I started a little bit late. Um, well, it's three o'clock. Should we go five more minutes? I have another video I'm gonna be releasing. Uh, it's three o'clock now. Hmm. I got somewhere to be this evening. I think I'll roll out another Macna part two video tomorrow. I just don't think I'll have time today to do it. But that one will feature some little tiny fish. You're gonna love them. And I'm excited to show that to you. I almost glued it on the last video I released two days ago. But it was, uh, it made the video even longer and I thought, no, I'm going to cut it off at that. I guess it was 14 minutes long. I'm going to make the next video start off with those fish and some other stuff I saw. But I do think that uh, you're going to love them. I, I'd like to think you would. I, I think they're awesome. And it's, it's a, uh, a benchmark, uh, a landstone reached. I can't even think of the right word. Boy, I have no language today. Last night's partying really ruined my brain. <laughs> Thanks guys, I appreciate uh, the support and I'm really glad that the streams are working again. I don't have a topic yet for live streams, you know, for next year. Oh. oh, you know what? That's not true at all. I have a huge topic for next week. So next week or next weekend, I'm having a party here at my house and it's going to be uh, like a viewing party as we tear my reef to shreds, <laughs> take out all the giant corals, break them up into small pieces glue them on the rock. We're going to put brand new frags into the system as well that my buddy Dwayne is bringing from his system in uh, Washington. And that is going to be a lot of fun. I um, also am going to be visiting Ryan's thousand gallon reef that's been running for about a year now and the night before. So my plan is to do some live stream of what we're doing with the tank. But there's probably going to be more time lapse because this is going to take a long time and some videos to share from that day. But the way the party works, I'm gonna have food and drink here so people can hang around and watch and it's gonna run all day next Saturday. So if you're in my immediate area and you wanna come to this party, you gotta contact me and let me know you're coming because I need a head count. <laughs> I can't just open it up to the 30,000 of you. <laughs> my neighbors would be mad. Uh, but uh, yeah, now I'm excited about this. I'm, I just took a picture of my reef today, you know, head on the full tank shot that everyone likes to share. Because this is like the last seven days of me looking at my tank the way it looks right now. And that's going to change. My name is spelled with a C. So thank you. Uh, someone was asking which way to spell it. Uh, your autocorrect always has it wrong. It never automatically adds a C to mark. So it's mark with a C. <laughs> All right, guys. Uh, I think that's it for there. One last thing. I did my water parameters for the week. And uh, I posted them on Instagram. Instagram.com slash me loves reef. Let me put that on the screen for you really quick. So if you did your water testing today, make sure you hashtag water testing, hashtag post your results and at me loves reef so I can follow you. My uh, water has gotten better and worse at the same time. I'll give you a quick little update. My alkalinity is up. Go figure. I need to go adjust my calcium reactor. My phosphates are down because phosphate RX works great. Uh, it was like 0.1. So I went down from 0.5 to 0.1, which is awesome. My uh, calcium is at 425, my magnesium's a little low,
but I noticed that the tubing for my dosing pump was clogged, so I squished it to kind of break it up and let it flow fluid again. So I'll be adding another gallon and a half of magnesium to my reef. Um, temperature is 77.5 right now, pH is 8.22 at the moment, and ORP is 355. Nitrate is skyrocketing yet again. And that is going to be coming up in some kind of a video. Uh, basically, <clears throat> the test kit I had that I've been believing was telling me incorrectly all this time that my nitrates were low. And I believed it. <laughs> so I got a brand new kit, opened it up today, and yeah, they're really high. So I am going to have to get those nitrates down. And I'm about to mix, mix a whole bunch of salt water. We're gonna be working on the reef. There's gonna be huge water changes. I think that I'll get those numbers back down where they belong. It's just kind of discouraging when you are testing and you think you're on top of it and then you uh, find out that your test kit wasn't true. So um, the, the, I'm sure several is gonna say, well, what brand was it? Um, my brand is Elos. I use Elos for most of my tests and that kit was measuring around one or two. And when I got the replacement kit, because apparently my kit was a bad kit, it wasn't expired. It was still good for about five more months. And I opened a brand new kit that was good until next year. And it also measured low. Apparently these kits were in a warehouse where they got overheated and then they were just ruined. And you know, then I bought them. And uh, so I had bad numbers all this time. and didn't even know it. <clears throat> so if you are not a person that sends your water off to be tested, the ICP testing that we hear about, that probably is a great way to double check your numbers. Another choice, of course, is to take your water to your fish store and have them test with their kits just to double check your own numbers. And I guess periodically, you know, I just need to commit to doing that. And, you know, I, I, I stay on top of my kits. I'm measuring every week. And so I would think, you know, I would know what the heck's going on in my reef. And that's why I say my reef lives in spite of me. <laughs> okay, guys, thanks so much for watching. Um, next video, the rollout will be the part two of MACNA. And then there'll be a part three. And if there's still time, there'll be a part four. I don't know. We'll see how it works in the editor. And other than that, I hope you guys have a great weekend. And if you're in Florida, oh my God, I hope you're going to be okay. I'm really worried about you guys. I, I cannot believe uh, what Irma is projected to do. And it's all supposed to happen now. It's giving me chills just thinking about it. I feel so bad for that entire area. And uh, so my thoughts go out to you. And I, I hope that if you guys are watching this, um, so that you're somewhere safe. Okay. Keep your heads down and, you know, I wish the best for your tanks, too. Thanks, guys. Have a great weekend.